Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Our guest today is Gail Hirschhatter, a distinguished professor of history at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and author of this book, her latest, Women and China's Revolutions. Gail, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks. Let me, you trace uh, two centuries of activity in your book. Yeah. I want to do a little sausage making before we get into the content. Uh, tell us how you decided to ta tackle what is a, a major undertaking. I think if I'd been left to my own devices, I never would have decided to tackle this. <laughs> you did this um, under duress. <laughs> the, a, a publisher approached me and asked me to do it, and I had said no many times to similar requests. Yeah. But I was starting to feel like this field, which is the field of Chinese women's history, that has grown so much over the course of my scholarly career, has really started to change things and change the way we look at Chinese history, and I thought maybe it was time to take stock and also figure out what do I care about my students knowing from this vast amount of scholarship that mm -hmm. started to pile up? What, what's the take home? How long did it take? A lot longer than I thought it would. Mm. It probably went on for about five or six years wow. in yeah. between other commitments. So you, you, know, you, you talk about this new field of, of endeavor, sort of a new lens to, to look at history. And what you say is that women's labor, not just in China, but elsewhere, mm -hmm. has been an underutilized way to look back at the past. I think so. I think we start paying attention to women's labor when women come out and work in the public sphere and are visible, and that really ignores a very long-standing role in the household economy and also reproductive labor. And in China, where a lot of production was organized inside the household um, f from quite a long time ago, including spinning and weaving in the house and women participating in farming, all of that just got su subsumed under household. Mm -hmm. and no one ever talked about it. And yet, to me, it seems to have underwritten the development of households and the development of China's economy and pieces of China's socialist revolution and also China's recent rise as a world power. Does, does, the, does when you look at history and you look back at various events, whether a revolution, a political movement, a war, and you look through this lens, does it change dramatically or incrementally? Both, I think. There Depending are, on the context? There are some moments where the question of women becomes a big question and suddenly everyone is talking about it. One of those moments is the, towards the end of the last dynasty, so basically turn of the 20th century and uh, into the May 4th movement of 1919, which we're coming up on the 100th year anniversary of very soon, when uh, a number of thinkers said, China's in a mess and China's in a mess because we don't treat our women properly and we need a remake of the culture and it has to start with the family and it has to involve the status of women. So that's a moment where people stand up and say, everything needs to change. But of course, undergirding that, there are a lot of much slower, more incremental, equally important changes. And part of the challenge is to try to track both of those in a book like this. That, that emergence of the, the woman question, I think, as you phrase it at some points, it, was it led by academics? There were a lot of professors and students, and but also people who had been government officials in the late Qing who looked at uh, incursions from the West mm -hmm. and China's weakness compared to Europe and America and a rising Japan and said, what's wrong with us? How can we seek wealth and power? And one of the things they looked at when they looked at other societies was what was going on with the status of women. And it caused a big critique of older Chinese family arrangements and notions of hierarchy. One of the reviews that I, that I read uh, said that you addressed the question, how does women's history intersect with and alter our understanding of a big history? Explain mm -hmm. the concept of big history as in this context. Well, think about any history course you've ever taken. It tends to get organized around events. World War I, World War II, French Revolution, American Revolution, Chinese Revolution. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to know was, are we just adding local color here by saying women were there too, women participated, women were nurses in this and that battle, or does it change what really counts as an event? And what I decided is that you have to ask questions like, did women have a Chinese revolution? If so, when did they have it? Was the content the same as the content of the revolution that men had? Mm -hmm. um, if not, why not, and in what respects? And every single one of those kind of cracks open the picture of the big history that we look at and says you have to reframe this. So uh, you, the, the point then becomes that scholars have to rethink what they thought they knew. That's 
the hope of That's every historian. Right, yes. right. So in, in w when we look at different areas, say, you know, popular culture or warfare or revolutions, let's take them one at a time. I know in the book you go through essentially linear history. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you start, uh, you know, back in, uh, what's the first year that is covered? Oh, more or less 1800. 1800, because right. of 200 years, and you work right. your way up, and then 78 to question mark, right, the new modern right. era and where right. that's going to head to. So let, let's take a warfare, for example. Mm -hmm. Are there elements that you could point to that are significant different ways Ways of looking at it after you applied this lens? Well, I think if you wanted to take a more or less big history approach to warfare, you'd say, well, there was this battle and that turning point, and how did women participate in that? But if you want to look at something like World War II in China, which of course started much earlier than it did here, mm -hmm. it started with the Japanese invasion of Northeast China in 1931, and it went on straight through till 1945. You're looking at the displacement of huge populations, including a lot of women and children. And there is a kind of Rosie the Riveter phenomenon going on there. But there is also a scene where women are moving across the landscape in ways they haven't had to before, or the men in the families are disappearing because they're trying to avoid conscription or because they've been conscripted, and women are left on their own in a way that they haven't habitually been before. And so you have to look at the changing roles of women in that kind of a circumstance in order to see the full range of changes that wartime affected. When, when you look at various categories of whether it's family life mm -hmm. or migration, or mm -hmm. is there an area that in particular jumps out to you as uh, appearing much m most different when you look at it through the role of women? With respect to wartime or in general? In general, in China's history, in the 200 years that we're talking about. Uh, in general, I would say the two themes that I tried to pursue in this book were what happened to women's labor? When did it become more visible, less visible? When was it made to disappear as people looked away from it and said the problem is women just stay home and they're footbound and they're parasites, completely looking away from everything they were doing to support the household economy. So women's labor is one thing. It's emergence as a cornerstone of how do we build our nation mm -hmm. so we can compete? Well, we mobilize women's labor. And then the other theme is how do people talk about woman as the symbol of what's going wrong or what's going right with China? Um, does woman, like uh, a figure like the modern girl, the cigarette smoking, dance hall loving person of 1930s and 1940s Shanghai, is that a good kind of modern or is it a bad kind of modern? So woman is taken as representing either national strength or uh, the nation's going to disintegrate because the women aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. You, in chapter two, uh, you say by the turn of the 20th century mm -hmm. that the treatment of women was increasingly interpreted as a symptom of weakness. You mentioned that earlier. Yes. So what was then the reaction to that and how long did it take to percolate? Well, there were lots of different kinds of reactions, and some of them are the kind of incremental change you were talking about. Like a long, slow thing that's happening in here is the growth of education for women. Elite women had always been educated in the home, um, but the beginning of public schools for women and vocational schools for women, some missionary run, but increasingly run by Chinese uh, reformers, makes a whole different kind of trajectory of girlhood and young womanhood and mm -hmm. starts to open up certain careers that are considered particularly appropriate for women. So that's one thing that goes on. Another thing is the rise in cities of factory labor in which uh, women come out to work and actually dominate parts of the workforce in China's biggest industrial city in the first half of the 20th century, Shanghai. Um, textiles were one of the biggest sector and women were the majority of workers. They were thought to be more easily controlled, which turned out to be not entirely <laughs> true. They turned out to be often quite obstreperous. Um, but also they were considered key to keeping those textile mills competitive because mm -hmm. they were cheaper. Uh, most of those women came from the countryside and so there's also a whole story in here that it's really hard to get a handle on because the sources are so scattered. What happened to the 80 or 85 percent of, of Chinese women who lived in the countryside um, in a moment of, of uh, periodic rural crisis? Less data on them than those who are in, in the uh, urban settings? Yeah, anyone who's in one place and can be it's surveyed, to track it because up. this is the same time there's a rise of social scientific surveys. So who is it easiest to count? 
people concentrated yeah. in one place. And then there are spot studies of the countryside. I promised I wasn't going to attempt to be linear, so I want to go That's back okay. to chapter one because you mentioned the elite women in yes. education. You you make this decision in chapter one to create these composites. Right. Explain that that idea. It's it's fascinating approach. Well, I just wanted to take what the scholarship has accomplished over the last 40 years and say, what do we know about educated women? And there's actually quite a lot of good scholarship, none of which is directly my work. I depended very much on um, a terrific group of scholars who have gone in and looked at what was life like in the 17th, 18th, 19th century for women in China's most developed rural areas. Are those areas. the three women you dedicate the book to? Uh, no, no, but no, but there, if you look at the footnotes, no, if you look at the footnotes, there are, no, the women I dedicate the book to, let me just say a thing about okay. that, are, are three women, Marjorie Wolf, Marilyn Young, and Delia Davin, who were among the people who in the 1970s said, what's wrong with this picture of Chinese history? Something mm -hmm. is missing here. And they were all very concerned with the relationship of women to China's revolution, and they all did amazing work, and they are all no longer with us, and I wanted their role recognized. But women who worked on the, the period covered by the first couple chapters of this book said, look, women knew how to read, they knew how to write, they were educated women we're talking about here. They were responsible for educating their kids at home. Their husbands were often away chasing uh, success in the civil service examinations and serving as officials all over the empire, leaving them to manage the family land holdings, arrange the kids' marriages, get the sons ready for to take the civil service exams themselves, keep up appearances, sell their embroidery if necessary, if cash ran short while the husband was running around trying to achieve professional success. If you took away the labor of those women, the whole system of governing the empire would have breaks down. Um, would have broken down. You, you uh, uh, speaking of individuals now mm -hmm. beyond composites, in chapter four I thought there was a, a fascinating story where you say that a, a generation of activists was galvanized by a suicide. Mm -hmm. Could you mm -hmm. tell that story? Well, there is a very famous story that was written up in the press in the period leading up to um, the May 4th movement of 1919, in which a woman was riding in a sedan chair to her marriage, and it was a patrilocal marriage system, so women moved in with their husband's family, their husband's parents at marriage. She, it was an arranged marriage, as marriages were then. She reportedly didn't agree to this marriage, didn't want this marriage, and um, she concealed a blade and slit her throat in the sedan chair on the way to her husband's house. So we know actually very little about what the story was with her. So it's not really a biography. What happened was... But it resonates. In a when way. this was reported, everybody started to write about it. And one person that wrote a whole series of articles about it, whose name later became a bit of a household word, was Mao Zedong later chair of the Chinese Communist Party and, and one of the leaders of the Chinese Revolution. But at this point, he was a younger person who, like many others, said, this woman wasn't killed by her own hand. Society killed her. We, ha we need a new culture. We have to do something about this society. And a sign of what's wrong with it is the position in which it puts women that produces this kind of extreme act. Are there other individuals that d deserve to be mentioned, you know, who are, are either champions or, or key thinkers at key junctures? There are lots. Um, the most famous ones, and I tried to gather up some of this material here, one was a woman named Qiu Jin, who was a very uh, active revolutionary at the end of the Qing dynasty and who was arrested and beheaded for um, supposedly having taken part in a plot to try to assassinate a Qing official. But before she did that, she had started a women's newspaper, she taught in a women's school, she wrote a novel about women trying to free themselves, uh, she had studied in Japan for a little while. She w and, and what's interesting about her is she was given a kind of criminal's grave. Two of her friends had her eventually respectably buried. But in total, I think um, she had nine burials, each one, especially after the revolution, in an increasingly grandiose tomb. <laughs> Till they get it right. Uh, well, well, and, 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 and right. because she became more, more and more important as a symbol of everyone rising up to participate to mm -hmm. end the Qing dynasty. Now, uh, if, you know, moving toward modern times, uh, you, you called the final chapter Capitalized Women. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? 
Well, I would say that China, which currently is officially known by its government as a market socialist society, is in effect a form of state capitalism. And that women have been incorpora incorporated into a globalized workforce. Um, you know, they've made our Apple phones and probably a lot of what you and I are both wearing and many other things. They are fully integrated into mm -hmm. a global economy. And many of the women who've been pulled into that system have been pulled out of rural villages, not unlike those people that went to work in the Shanghai textile mills I was talking about a while ago. So, but this time, they're really fully integrated into and a key part in a globalized labor force. So I wanted to try to look at some of the implications of China's increasingly important role in the world economy. Is, that's, that's a classic double-edged sword scenario, right? You're exploiting cheaper labor, but, that's right. but also giving opportunities that didn't previously exist. That's right. On balance, how does that work out? Is it largely a positive in this, prog in this pr progression, or, or is it an ongoing double-edged sword? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. It, is, it, it creates some extremely exploitative labor conditions. I think women as individuals and as sometimes as collectives work really hard to try to improve the situation they're in. And they keep coming because for a lot of them, the countryside is now a place, it's a residual place of very little interest. And for them, it's not where it's happening. And many of them, although they are formally classified as farmers, have themselves never farmed. Mm -hmm. They got out as soon as they graduated from junior high, they went to the cities to work. Some of them marry and have kids in the cities and they don't want to go back down on the farm in general. Um, and yet, they are still classified as farmers who don't have full residence rights in Chinese cities, and that inhibits their ability to organize sometimes. I think it's during this period that we see this emergence of this single child policy. Uh, uh, the, 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 the rise and fall. Rise and fall. <laughs> yes. Could you talk about, uh, about that, and how, it, how it came to, to be and, and, and how it unraveled? Well, the single child policy um, in the late 1970s, a uh, number of Chinese planners looked around and said, if we're going to try to develop economically, have a big push for economic development, oops, it looks like the population has grown quite a lot since the 1950s. We don't want it to continue at this rate and, can, and eat up everything we managed to develop. And they came up with a very crude thing. Their one goal was to, was a kind of macro demographic goal to decrease the size of the population by decreasing reproduction. And they said one child per family. It was pretty thoroughly enforced in the cities. It was not so thoroughly enforced in the countryside as a one child policy, but it created a lot of conflict over people having subsequent births in the countryside, and sometimes some violence and sometimes so, some coercion. Not so much as a matter of central government policy as a matter of local policy. So that goes on for a while. And then a couple of years ago, the state said, uh-oh, it looks to us like we have a situation where we have a, a, a shrinking labor pool supporting an ever-increasing group of people who, thanks to the improvement in the standard of living, are living longer and needing more care as elders. A global phenomenon. That's right. That's right. Um, but on a very large scale here. Mm -hmm. And so then they said, well, maybe two children would be a better idea. And what was interesting was that people's demographic desires, especially in the cities where life is very expensive, but also in the countryside where in order to bring in a bride for your son, you have to accumulate quite a lot of cash and possessions, people did not hop to and say, let's have more and more kids. In fact, um, there, if you looked at what was going on on Chinese social media at that time, a lot of women, especially urban women, were saying, oh no, now my husband's family is going to come after me to have a second kid. I just started to get my life back after yeah. the first one, and they are massively expensive to raise. And so what happened is in the time between 1979 and, say, 2015, 2016, Chinese society had changed so radically, and that, that includes changes in people's demographic desires, that the state suddenly decides it wants to have a pronatalist policy and people don't want to show up for it. So that's a new problem, and I don't know how that's going to play out. The, the whole uh, cliches about history, either repeating or rhyming or whatever right. it might do. What, what does your 200 years of research tell you about where China's headed? I don't think things are so linear. For a long time, we were asking ourselves, and by we, I mean the people that tried to bring women's history into the bigger picture of Chinese history, is 
fill-in-the-blank policy or a big history event, good or bad for Chinese women? And as I just said, the answer usually is, yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think recently what we've seen with the emergence of private property in the cities and a big real estate boom is that women's property rights are not all that secure and nobody paid attention to that during a more socialist period when property rights weren't a big thing. Um, but they're now in a situation where as they're buying houses, it's, it's the custom for the man to be on the deed. And a woman named Leda Hong Fincher has written a book about, partly about this called Leftover Women, mm -hmm. in which women also say, well, it's only proper. My husband might not feel like a man if his name weren't the name on the property deed. Even if she and her family are helping with the mortgage and she's, she's putting in money every month for monthly expenses, the divorce rate is also going up come a divorce, suddenly it turns out all of this stuff lands in litigation. So you can't ever say, okay, that question's settled. No. Things come up under... I, I'm in sorry to context. say I might know some American males that suffer from a similar... <laughs> <conversation>. <laughs> that, that, uh, uh, speaking of that, of that comparison and contrast, what, what does feminism look like in China today? Would it be recognizable to uh, an American or a European? How, how does it compare? I'd say feminism is alive and well, but it's fragmented. There are a group of people that were very active in the 1980s and 1990s, especially around the time when um, the UN Fourth World Conference on Women met in Beijing in 1995, and suddenly the Chinese state discovered it was good to have women's studies programs, it was good to have um, gender-oriented development programs, and there was a kind of flourishing of um, all kinds of activity, both governmental and non-governmental activity then. The most recent group of feminists to emerge are very social media savvy, very performance art oriented, and there were a group of them called the Feminist Five, who represent more than five people, that were actually arrested a couple of years ago because they were planning a demonstration. They were planning to hand out material uh, against sexual harassment and sexual violence, which the Chinese government is also against. Mm. Um, but the idea that someone else other than the party and the state is initiating political activity proved to be too much for this particular government, and they did a kind of preemptive arrest um, and eventually let them out, but um, never dropped charges against them so they could be rearrested at any time. So I would say there are at least several generations of feminists currently operating in different domains doing different kinds of things. Okay. Final thought, uh, in, a, in a very humble statement, you say that you're not satisfied with where you ended <laughs> up and that readers shouldn't be either. Yeah. And you hope that the field of inquiry continues. W where should it head next? Well, one thing is China is not a ethnically unified society, and I very much focused on the majority ethnic group, Han Chinese here, but all along the borderlands, as you know if you read any news concerning China, there is all kinds of ethnic difference, and there is quite a lot of conflict, especially in the northwest and western ends around Xinjiang and Tibet currently. And there are people doing very good work on those societies, but I didn't feel like we knew enough for me to uh, make a comprehensive statement about it, and I would, and I'm not satisfied with that. Yeah. Well, you should be satisfied with an uh, incredible achievement. You know, some books are written in five weeks. You took five <laughs> years. The book is Women and China's Revolution. Gail Hirschhatter, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, John. Hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join us again soon for another edition of Wilson Center Now. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us.